Would you please stand for the reading of God's holy word? Today, our lesson comes from Philippians 4, 4 through 9. And perhaps this will be, uh, you will remember this from last week. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be Thanks to God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Now I want to let you know I, I did not plan on starting with a joke this morning. However, Mr. Gene Bunce asked me if I had a joke. And on top of that, Miss Pam happened to share one that she found on the internet. So uh, here we go. It's an oldie but a goodie. You've heard me say it before maybe, but I love it. I, I, I thought, boy, I just have to, we'll just start with this. It has nothing to do with the sermon whatsoever, but, uh, <laughs> but we'll take it for what it's worth. Face value, okay? Burglar broke into a house, and uh, he's sneaking across, and he's you know, gathering up all the valuables, and, and all of a sudden he hears in the midst of the darkness... Jesus is watching. And he thinks to himself, what in the world is this? And he, he's scared and everything. And, and, uh, and, and, and after a while, it goes quiet. And so he begins sneaking around and grabbing a few other things. And once again, he hears those words, Jesus is watching. Just about that time, he runs his flashlight around. And he sees over in the corner uh, this, this parakeet. And he says, uh, is that you saying that? And the parakeet said, yes. And he goes, who in the world do you think you are? And, and the parakeet says, Moses. <laughs> and the burglar says, who in the world names their parakeet Moses? And the parakeet responds, the same people that name their Rottweiler Jesus. <laughs> we did good, Pam. <laughs> All right. We're continuing this morning in our sermon series that uh, has been inspired by Max Lucado's book, Anxious for Nothing. If you haven't had a chance to pick that up, I encourage you to. If, if, if you just want to follow along with the sermon series, you're welcome to do that as well. Uh, it's a good book. I was, when I read it, or was listening to it, actually, I bought it on, on an audio book, and, and I just remember thinking to myself, boy, this will preach. And that's when God said, yes, it will. And uh, so that's why we're having this sermon series. Is, uh, it's inspired by this book. It's based on God's Word. Uh, and, uh, and so that's what we're talking about today because I think anxiousness, anxiety, is something we all struggle with at one time or another. The challenge is not to allow it to consume us or become this perpetual place that we live in. So with that in mind, let's bow our heads and we'll have a word of prayer to prepare our hearts as we go into this message this morning. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts today about the anxieties and the challenges and the stresses and the strains that we face. Give us practical ways in which we might overcome and live in the peace that you provide. Help us to be the people you've called us to be, so give us ears to hear the message you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Back when, uh, when I was a little boy, I, I was a part of Cub Scouts, and, and then uh, later on, I, I was a part of Weebelows. I didn't make it much further than that, but, but I remember Weebelows because we went camping in Weebelows. And uh, there was this one camp out that we went on in particular that was actually kind of an eventful camp out. Uh, it was probably the first one. It was the dad and son camp out. And I remember going on this camp out, and we went to somebody's farm, 
and there we, you know, we learned to start a fire with, you know, rubbing sticks together, whatever we did. You know, we cooked over that fire. We, we, uh, we, we put our, our tents up, you know, and, and, and everything like that. And it was, a, it was a lot of fun until about midnight. And around midnight was when the rain decided to show up. And the lightning decided to show up. And the wind decided to show up. And, 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 and I was in a tent with, with a couple of other boys, this little tent. And, and my dad was in the, the, the safety and comfort of our van uh, that was parked up at the road. And uh, he, he was in the, one of those bench seats just keeping all safe and sound. But, but I can remember that night and the, and the water dripping in. And, and I don't think they had taught us about how to, how to put the trench around the tent yet because it was seeping in and seeping under and all kinds of, of, kind of good stuff. And I just remember that tent wasn't that secure uh, for that experience. But we survived nonetheless. Uh, and I did give my father a hard time about that. You know, if only the storms of life that we face were just a bunch of wind and rain. It's not true. If not, if only the storms of life that we face were only limited to a little bit of wind and a little bit of rain. But instead, as Max Lucado points out, our tempest consists of the big D's of life. Difficulties, divorce, disease, and death. And you can probably name some other storms that you've faced, things that have challenged you, things that have, have, have welled up inside of you, this anxiety that life sometimes can produce. Max says life is full of difficulties, challenges that come our way, and things that build anxiety in our lives. Now, you know, as you think about Paul, who, who, who penned these words that, that Diane read for us today from, that we're looking at. Each Sunday, we're going to be rereading these words, kind of meditating on them, letting them, letting them reside in us for a while. And, and when you look at these words, you, you might think that Paul was experiencing some relative ease in his life. You might think that maybe Paul's, he's retired or something, you know. He's, he's on the golf course. He's, he, he's just taking it easy. So he's so sure it's easy for him to write these words when his life was a thing of ease. But nothing could be further from the truth. He was about 60 years old, uh, experts believe, when he wrote these words. He had traveled thousands and thousands of miles. And he did not have heated seats or an air conditioner on his car. He didn't have a car. All he had were the sandals on his feet as he went from town to town, hard miles to go and share the gospel. Paul did not face uh, friendly welcomes in every town that he came to. Many of the towns he came to, he faced adversities. He had authorities that were against him, people that would throw him out. He was beaten. He was lashed. He was left for dead. He had been deserted by his friends from time to time. Paul faced all manner of hardships. He was even thrown in jail multiple times. All he could see were the bars of the jail or the four walls that were around him and and no hope of escape. And, And yet Paul still penned these words. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Did you catch that? Fifth word, rejoice in the Lord always. He didn't say rejoice in the Lord when when things are going great. He didn't say rejoice in the Lord when you're cruising through retirement. He didn't say rejoice in the Lord when the stock market is going good. He didn't say rejoice in the Lord when your children have come to visit you. He didn't say rejoice in the Lord when your golf game is on the upswing. He says rejoice in the Lord always. No matter what the circumstance is, no matter what you're facing, no matter what challenge, what tempest, what storm, rejoice in the Lord always. How is this possible? How can Paul not be angry or bitter or overwhelmed or stressed out? How can Paul not be riddled with anxiety, facing all the challenges from his difficult past and at the present, at the time in which he was writing this? How? Because. Paul had firm convictions in his faith. Paul had firm convictions about what he believed. Paul did not have a wimpy tent. (laughs) Paul's tent was his faith. 
Paul's tent was his belief system about how he understood God and, and God's work in the world. What Paul believed affected him. It affected how he responded to life as life went on around him. It affected how he saw the events in his life and what was happening to him and what was happening around him. It affected how his behavior was, even in the midst of the challenges. It affected what his internal temperature was spiritually when facing the challenges around him. And if you look a little bit closer at Paul's tent, the, the, the middle pole, the thick, solid middle pole that held his tent secure in the middle of all that was his understanding of the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. Paul believed beyond a doubt that he could trust God even in the midst of challenges. Paul believed in the Lord God Almighty. Paul believed in the one who made the heavens and the earth. Paul believed in God, in his grace, in God's provision, in God's love, in God's grace, and in God's goodness. Paul had firm convictions about what he believed. Now, I want to take a side road here for a second. Because I want to I unpack this whole idea of what is the sovereignty of God. And the reason I want to do this, especially for those of you that are reading the books, you, what you need to understand is, is Max Lucado, uh, he, he comes from a different faith tradition, a Christian tradition, uh, than, than we do as Methodists. And so there's some different understandings of the sovereignty of God. And so I want to clarify a Wesleyan understanding or a Methodist way of understanding the sovereignty of God. In, in Max's view... Uh, God is not only the master of all things, God is also the author of all things. So in other words, when we face hardships or difficulties or when bad things happen in this world, it's all a part of God's plan, it's all a part of, of God's will, it's all a part of, uh, of, of God's plan for us. This is the same kind of thinking that gets us the phrase which we hear, and some of us have said uh, this phrase that says, you know what, everything happens for a reason. Maybe you've said that before. Maybe you've heard somebody say that. Something bad happens or something go, not, doesn't go your way and, or something doesn't go someone's way and you kind of go, well, you know what? Everything, everything happens for a reason. Someone gets cancer. There must be a reason for that. That's, that's our way of attempting to explain it. There must be a reason for it. So, you know, everything happens for a reason. Somebody is injured in a car wreck and we say, well, you know what? Everything happens for a reason. Uh, we don't get the job, or, 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 or we, we get fired, or, 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 or whatever. Oh, you know, everything happens for a reason. The reason we search for a reason for things happening is because we want to understand them. We want to explain them. We want to, to be able to, to feel like there's some sort of order to it all. And, and so uh, we assume that, that, that if it's happened, then it must be a part of God's plan. If something's happened, then it must be a part of God's plan. It must be a part of God's will. The reality, however, is that everything does not happen for a reason. Everything does not happen. Okay, now another sidestep. Sometimes everything happens for a reason, and the reason is because you've made a bad decision. <laughs> you know? But everything, you can't... Let me, let, me, let me unpack this a little more. If everything happened for a reason, as some people say, then this makes God out to be the, the, uh, the author of some great and terrible acts. And acts of evil are never part of God's will. God's will and intent for us, we saw that in the Garden of Eden, and we will see it again in full in heaven, in the new heaven and the new earth. That is God's original intent and will for each and every one of us. What we have today is, 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 is because of a fall, because of sin that has entered this world. This, uh, this line of reasoning does two things. First, it removes human responsibility from evil and negative acts. And second, it makes God culpable for all evil in the world. The reality of life is that evil that happens in this world is not God's will. In fact, it's thwarting God's plan. Please know that it's not God's will that a gunman shoots innocent children in the school. 
It's not God's will for your loved ones to get cancer or for you to get, get cancer. It's not God's will for your friend to die in a car wreck because someone was texting and driving. Bad things happen in this world because sin entered this world, as the Bible uh, explains to us in Genesis chapter 3. And because we live in a broken and, and fallen world where disease and sickness are a part of it because of that, there's... Where, where we live in this world where there's well-meaning and not so well-meaning people who make bad decisions. The bottom line is this. We are a fallen and broken people living in a fallen and broken world. The world in which God originally created did not have the disease and did not have the sickness and did not have the brokenness. This reality, however, does not, le- does not lessen in any way, shape, or form the sovereignty of God. God can still be sovereign and not be the author of all things. In in fact, even though God is not the author of all things, He is certainly the master of all things. You see, our understanding of God's sovereignty does not include a a, a script where God is the script writer for every action, situation, and experience. Uh, God can be fully sovereign even in the midst of a fallen and broken world. God and His sovereignty is at work. God is at work in our world, and through His sovereignty, He is at work in people's lives. And even as we face the challenges of this world, we can rest assured that God is at work for good in you and in me. Because God always has our ultimate good in mind. You see, even though God is not the author of all things, He still, in His sovereignty, uses all things for His purposes. God is in, the, is in the business of redeeming even the worst situations and bringing something good about that. We read about that in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, where we read, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Sometimes in the, the midst of our anxiety-inducing struggles, we wonder, you know, does God even care? Is God even aware of what goes on down here does god even know what i'm going through well deism says no deism says god created the universe and then he abandoned it Uh, pantheism says no creation is no story or purpose unto itself it's only part of god itself atheism says no if you don't believe in god how can you believe in a god that cares but christianity on the other hand says yes Yes, there is a a God, and yes, God is good. And yes, God is personally interested and involved in our everyday lives. Yes, God created us. Yes, God loves us. Yes, God wants to be in relationship with us. God is at work in in our lives, even to the extent of using the challenges that we face, the difficulties that we face, to make us stronger people, to make us better people, to, to, to sanctify us. In other words, to, to, to draw us more and more into the likeness and, and image of Jesus Christ, to shape and to mold us. He'll take every opportunity to do that. And he'll use even those difficult situations to teach us on how we can be better people. Now let's change gears and get back to anxiety, and I'm going to tie this all in together in just a minute. Anxiety is often the consequence of perceived chaos. Anxiety is often the consequence of perceived chaos. Perceived chaos that comes from our sense of of not being in control. And as such, our anxieties increases as our perceived control diminishes. Control is a funny thing. Some of us some of us have control issues. Some of us work really hard at, 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 uh, at, at, at wanting to control everything about our lives. Because that anxiety, when it comes in, it, it, it races our hearts and, and it makes our minds to race. And, and it gets us all worked up. And we think, we think somehow that, it, that in the midst of anxiety, if I can just squeeze life a little harder, if I can just... Con- can kind of get things together a little easier, a little better, that, that that's what it's going to take, you know? And so what, what do we do? We, we hold on to things or people, or we try, to, we try to manipulate things to work in the way that we think would be the best way for them to work. We, we, we grip tighter life when we face anxiety because we're attempting to gain control. What happens, however, is that we realize, if we are open to it, 
that no matter how tightly we squeeze our fists on the situations of life that cause us anxiety, we don't control them one darn toot. It doesn't do us any good. The Bible has a better idea. Instead of trying to control life when we face anxiety, what we ought to do is relinquish it. Instead of trying to control life, what we ought to do, the Bible teaches, is relinquish it. And this is the message behind Paul's instruction to us this morning, to rejoice in the Lord always. This is, this is what Paul understood to be the source of where peace is found, in this firm belief in God, in, in trusting God with our lives, in entrusting God with the people around us, in entrusting God with what he's called us to do. This is the teaching that Paul teaches. Peace is within reach, not for the lack of problems, but because the presence of a sovereign Lord. So rather than rehearse the chaos of the world, we ought to release and rejoice in the sovereignty of the Lord. Now, in order to find peace in the midst of anxious world, we've got to learn uh, to trust and rejoice in a God who is the master of all things. We need to learn to release and rejoice in a God who is at work in all things. We need to learn to release and rejoice in a God who is with us in all things. This is the sovereignty of God. It is the goodness of God in this world. It is in Him whom we need to learn to rejoice. It is to Him that we need to learn to release. You see, Paul was able to uh, rejoice in God in the midst of life's anxiety because he believed beyond the shadow of a doubt in a God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. As Max Lucado writes, he writes, to read Paul is to read the words of a man who in the innermost part of his being believed in the steady hand of a good God. He was protected by God's strength, preserved by God's love, he lived beneath the shadow of God's wings. To rejoice in the sovereignty of God is to learn to celebrate in the goodness of God. Let me say that again. To, to rejoice in the sovereignty of God in our lives is to learn to celebrate God's goodness in our lives. So how do we do that? How do we stabilize our souls in the midst of an anxious world? When, when, we're, when we're laying our head down at night on the pillow and those anxieties start coming to us, when, when we wake up in the morning, the first thing on our mind is that thing we're worried about or that thing that we can't control or that thing that, that seems to be weighing heavily upon us. When we're driving down the road and all we can think about are those anxious thoughts in our lives how do we stabilize our souls in the midst of all that we stabilize our souls in the midst of an anxious world by learning to always rejoice in the lord in other words instead of rehearsing the chaos of the world instead of allowing that tape to play in your head over and over again instead of allowing that to be the first thing you think about or, or talk about Instead of doing all those things, why not allow yourself to rejoice in God instead? Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul writes. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, rejoice means to give glory to God no matter what the circumstances, to praise God in, in the storms of life. The biblical example for us that, that you might have already thought about is Peter. I mean, think about Peter when, when they were in the boat and, and the disciples had the winds and the waves beating up against the side of the boat. And, and where do we find Jesus? Walking out to them on the water. And they thought he was a ghost and they were terrified at first, but it was Peter who, who said, hold on a second here, Lord, if it is you, call me out to you. And we know that Peter put himself on the side of that boat and he put his legs over the edge of that, that side of the boat and he put his feet down because God had called him, because the Lord had called him to go out on those waters. And what happened? It became solid for him. And he walked out on those waters because he had his eyes fixed on Jesus. Now I want you to think about something for a minute. The storm was still there. The waves were still beating him around him. But when he had his eyes fixed on Jesus, 
His life was held up. Now we know the rest of the story. He didn't stay in that position for long. He, he began to feel the water on the sides of his legs, and, and then he began to feel the wind on his face. And so instead of focusing in on Jesus, he begins to look to his right and to his left, and he begins to look at the problems that are around him. He began to look at the things that began to give him anxiety. And what happens when he does this? He slowly begins to sink. Now the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is Jesus is right there, just as he is for us. And so we find ourselves looking to our right and left. We find ourselves focused on the storms of our lives. He will be there to pick us up. If we will but turn to him in the midst of that. The takeaway from the story is this. If you find your vision consumed with anxiety, it's time to reorient your vision. It's time to fix your eyes on Jesus Christ. How do we do that? How do we, how do we do that? Well, we learn to rejoice. We rejoice in the sovereignty of God's presence with us. We rejoice in God's grace to us. We rejoice in the fact that God never leaves us. We rejoice in the fact that God sees us through even the most difficult challenges. We rejoice in God's provision for us. We rejoice in the fact that God is greater than our problems. We rejoice in the fact that God can and does and will use our most difficult circumstances to help us to grow in faith. We rejoice in the fact that even though God is still not the author of all things, He is still the master of all things. We rejoice in the sovereignty, the goodness of God. Now let's get practical for a minute. What does that look like? What does that look like on a on a on a day to day kind of basis? When when anxiety raises its head the first thing in the morning or the last thing at night or when we're driving, what does that look like? How do we do that? How do we rejoice in those times? Number one, here's three things you can do. Number one is you can start worshiping God in song. Start worshiping God in song. When you when you get a notification on your phone. You look at that notification, you see what it is, and you respond to it, don't you? In one way or another. Well, anxiety is the notification of your life. That something is going on, there, there's a message from God that you're, that, okay, if you're feeling anxiety, well, guess what? Your eyes are in the wrong place. So, pause. Take a pause and begin to worship God. Sing to Him. Give him glory. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a song. Turn on the Christian radio and, and find a song you know and sing along with it. It, it. Maybe you've got a hymn that's one of your favorites. Let, it be, let those hymns be in your mind and, and hum those to yourselves as you're driving down the road. Sing those to yourself. I remember my mom standing in front of the, of the kitchen sink and she would be doing the dishes at night and she would be just singing those hymns. Her mind and heart was in perfect peace even as she was washing dishes. Because her mind and heart was fastly stead upon her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When anxiety comes your way, the first thing you can do is worship God. The second thing you can do is you can pray a prayer of thanksgiving. Stop whatever it is you're doing and pray. Now, you may only have a few minutes to do that, or a, a, it could be a short, brief prayer, where you just say, God, I, I just, I, I just want to lay at your feet. Here's where I've been struggling, uh, and, and I want to then now praise you and give thanks to you for something good you're doing in my life so lord i may be struggling with this uh this issue at work but god right now i want to thank you for the ways you've been taking care of my family lately or i want to praise you for the the friends that you've given me in my life or i want to praise you so just do that shortly or if you've got more time just boy just pour your heart out to him pour out all those anxieties lay them at the feet of the cross so then you are free to focus and fully pray to god you know, we, we, uh, we do this in the mornings and the, in the evenings, some of us. I, I know I've, I've been guilty of this, and I've tried to change this pattern in my life. That when, when I first thing when I got up in the morning, what did I do? I reached on my bedside table where my phone was charging, and I pulled my phone over and said, okay, what's going on on Instagram? What's going on on Facebook? What's going on in the news? What's going on this? Uh-uh. Don't do that. And then what, the same thing happened at night. I'd be sitting in my bed for 30 minutes, seeing what's the latest, everything's in Facebook, what's the latest on the news, here's the challenges of the world, here's the struggles, here's the people are, are, you know, and guess what? Don't do that. May the first words out of your mouth in the morning be, O oh Lord, open my lips so my mouth may proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
be it that, be it the Lord's Prayer, be it something, but let the first words out of your mouth or the first words in your heart be of prayer and praise to God. Start your day off right and end it right as well. I've gotten in the habit now where from about nine on, I don't look at social media. And I stay away from the news too. Because I don't want those things just creating any anxiety in my life. So I try to take that time to be for God. So that when I lay my head down at night, I can lay it down in peace because I know I've been connected with God. So that's the second thing you do. When anxiety, when anxiety notification comes upon your life, pray. And here's the third thing you can do. Meditate. Meditate on God's Word. Find passages of Scripture that, that speak of God's goodness, that speak of God's provision, that speak of God's promise in your life. I know you can find these God's Promises uh, books that are, have all these scriptures that are listed by subjects. I don't care what it is. Fi read the Bible yourself and discover the scriptures for yourself. But when you find that scripture that really speaks to you, that God's promise of who He is in the midst of the anxieties of your life, write those down. Write them in a journal, put them on three by five cards, and leave them in those places where you struggle with anxiety. Whether it be when you lay your head down at night, or when you wake up in the morning, then you need to have a scripture card laying next to your bed. So that's the first thing you see in the morning. Maybe it's when you're getting ready and you're putting on your makeup or you're brushing your teeth and you're shaving. That's when you start thinking about your day and your anxiety level starts getting up. Have a, have a scripture card on your mirror. I used to, to put them in the shower. I would put them in a Ziploc baggie, and if you turn that Ziploc baggie with the zipper side down, the moisture in the shower, you could stick it to the wall of the shower, and it'll stay there for a while. And have that scripture, or I even had prayers written in there, just to remind me, so that when the notifications of anxiety come my way, it is a notification that points me to God, not to more anxiety. So meditate on God's Word. Read God's Word. Soak in God's Word. and Let it change your life. You are not meant to live in the perpetual world of anxiety. And with God's help, we can overcome. Amen? Amen.